So when he's sitting on the mountain with them, when he's healing people, when he's casting out demons, when he's doing all of what he's doing, when he's going through all these challenges with these religious leaders, he's trying to get the people to see the first priority in life is seeking the kingdom of God. That's the first priority. Seeking the kingdom of God. Then he said all these, so that means all the things that we desire to get, they're going to be added unto us. If you're not lazy and if you work and if you got a mind, that's, that's the image of God. God created us to be intelligent, to be comprehensive, to be productive, to be creative. But he wants that to be secondary. He's going to, he said if you seek him first, he's going to add all these things to you. And you know what's challenging about that? If, if you actually learning how to live for God and you really, really sacrifice the things for God, that scripture is not easy, can you? When you're in a situation in life where you know not the hand of God is on you, but you know down in your gut, God has specifically told you exactly what he wants you to do. For instance, I did Cook County Prison Ministry for 15 years, winter, summer, spring, and fall. I started off preaching on 63rd and Everhart in the hood when there was projects around, when there was gangs around. And I'm up there at Harold's Chicken on 63rd and Cottage Grove Street preaching and the church was right down the street. And I would be preaching to people and taking them down and get baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. But that was God's will for me then for about 10 years. 10 years in the subways of Chicago with a poor, with a poor pit of Bullhorn preaching the gospel. 10 years going to Cabrini Grain, going to Ida B. Wells, going to Dale Home, going to Ikey's, all these places with a few people with me. Started off by myself. I'm only mentioning this not to boast, but to make a point. When God puts something deep down in you, you're going to know when it's him because you won't be able to rest. You won't feel right. You feel a discomfort in your spirit. You just feel like you, you had edge. You just, life just don't seem the same. And when you start, so when God starts drawing you, he's going to deal with your conscience his way. You're not going to be able to explain it to me. You might come through that door and say, oh, Brother John Pastor Johnson, something's going on within my spirit. I can't figure it out. So what do you do? You learn how to keep praying. You learn how to keep talking to God. Because he's dealing with you. So when Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, he's talking about learn God's will for your life, which is simply practicing the principles of righteousness. And I promise you we ain't going to be perfect with it. But I promise you this, whatever has you bound, you can be delivered from that. And then when the next test comes, then you'll be able to know how to get delivered from that. But people that don't know how to be delivered are never going to be delivered the right way. They're going to get a piece of alcohol, crack, cocaine, drugs, cannabis, anything they can, psychiatrists, psychics, voodoo, whatever it is, they're going to try to find that peace. But until they seek God, it won't happen. So that's what we just wanted to bring out to you guys when you read that scripture. But nevertheless, God is good. And if anybody have a testimony, something you just want to praise God for, we're going to give you that, that time allowment to do that. Otherwise, we'll move on and minister. Like I always say, it might be a few of us here, but my priority is to speak what the word of the Lord has given me to speak to you. So any testimonies? No testimony. Well, I got a testimony. I thank the Lord that... My mother's out of rehab, and now she's living with me and my wife. She came yesterday, and I thank God for the opportunity of having a house to be able to bring my mother to, to be able to take care of her. She didn't always take care of me until I got grown, and she came back in my life. But nevertheless, she's my mother, and I love her. And I'm thankful to the Lord that not only am I thankful that I'm able to take care of her, but I really do have peace about it. I didn't at first. My heart was rushing. You're in the nursing field. You know how this go. You got somebody that you have to do almost everything for. My heart, brother Al, for some time I could feel. Doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm just starting to think, man, when she come in, this she come. But you know what I did? I did what the word said. I seek God first. Mm -hmm. I talked to God over and over and over. So I made up in my mind the best thing I can ask God for is a peace of mind. Lord, help me to go one day at a time. Give me peace of mind. And that's what he's doing. And so it is what it is. And I thank the Lord for that. So that's my testimony that God is just, he's just awesome. He's just good. Any more testimonies? <clears throat> no more testimonies. All right. All right. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. I don't know if you know that. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment. 
because in Proverbs chapter number 14 and 12, it says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is a direction, there is a path that man seems like it's okay to him. That's what the King James said. This translation said there is a way that appears to be right, but the end is leads to death. That's physical death, and that is also talking about spiritual death. So God did it his way. Now we want to kind of address what was talked about in Bible class Wednesday when um, Brother Alpha was asking the question about what kind of image do you see God as when you pray? How do you see him as an image? And Kenya, I think you sat in on this before when we talked about this, but we want to reiterate this probably periodically to a couple of people that come in that haven't heard this before because like I was saying um, going on, this is a very serious question that people want to answer for now. Even though it might not matter about what color he is, it still we still need to understand how did he even come about in the first place? To who who came to the conclusion of what how Jesus really looked? Who came to the conclusion of how the apostles really looked? I just want to throw that out there to you guys. This message is going to be very effective. It's going to be very penetrating. It's going to be very much helpful to you. But I have to give it to you from the historical facts and the truth of the circumstantial evidence. I want to ask you, who started the whole image Jesus thing? Where did that come from? Where do you think that came from? Uh, colonial. Colonial. Very good. You've been doing some studying. Colonial, historical. Okay. Very good. It came from colonial. Anybody else want to just... It's not important to you? Okay. All right. Well, now let's see. It's right. Colonial, but Romanization. When the Roman church started building... When Martin Luther, all these different people in the 1500, 1700, they start reprogramming the mind of Westernization. They start reprogramming the mind of Christianization. They start reprogramming the mind of religion through their own images and their own belief system. Remember, all of what we've been teaching when Jesus was on the scene, when the apostles were on the scene, the number one religion that was only respected for monotheism was Israel's God. All the other nations worship other gods. But when they would not bow to Caesar, when they would not bow to the Roman government, then persecution started for the church. So as persecution started for the church, things began to change for the church. But when you look at Noah and his sons, when they came off that ark, we, me and my wife went to, um, where was that in Kentucky, baby, Noah's ark? Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. You been there before? Yo, Alfred, you got to take your family to that, man. I think we went for three days or two days. No, we drove and came back, yeah. Uh, but it's so big, you can't go in one day. It's so it's, so, it's an actual art built, and it's everything historical in there. You're going to need at least two days with it. It's, it's awesome. But the guy, Ken Ham, I have his whole teaching. He is showing the original, the original sons of Noah and their daughters and they hugged their wife. Noah's sons, Ham, Sam, and Japheth, you can see they was of all different races, all different nationalities. And the scripture that goes that this is why it's not important about images and colors because look at what Revelation 7 and 9 says. After these things I look and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations. So it doesn't matter if they're white, it doesn't matter if they're black, it doesn't matter what their nationality is. Once they repent, once they learn how to serve God the way he teaches them to serve him, and if they die that way, then all nations, all tribes, all people, and tongues are going to go before God in judgment. All people. Standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white clothes, right robe and palm branches in his hands. In other words, he got the authority in his hand. It don't mean he's going to literally have palm branches. You have to know when the scripture is talking literal or if it's talking figuratively. But it's talking about the authority that he's going to have. But the whole point that I'm trying to make is it's not important about what color he was, but it is important to be able to give people some kind of historical understanding so that they won't be stuck. Because if you take somebody like Ezra, or you take somebody that probably like me and Alfred, and we was growing up, and you put two pictures up there, and you put the G's with the blue eyes and the straight hair, and you put the Jesus with the dreadlocks and the beard, the first one we're going to point to is the one that we already knew, the one with the image. We're going to point to that one. 
So that's my whole point. That doesn't matter. But when you look at the scriptures, you see how they change things with colonization, with Romanization. Here's the gospel of Mark. Mark is looked at as being a white man there, but here he's historically seen as a black man. Why? Because it's what you call whitewashing. That's not to be prejudiced. That's not to hinder or belittle nobody, but it's to show you the mindset of how they want us to think. So then when you look at Jesus, this is the Jesus that we grew up with because when the church of Rome, once the first century left, once the second century left, the church of Rome came along and they began to portray Jesus in their own images and their own likeness and along with that all the disciples. So we get in our mind that everything that's really accepted by God is only one particular race. But this is the historical setting. But when I did my research, I found out that they was of all different nationalities. Because like I said, when we went to Ethiopia, this is not going to be a history class. I'm just opening up. We're getting ready to get to the impact of what we're trying to say to you. But we just want to be able to give you some understanding. When we went to Ethiopia, I didn't, I never even thought about Acts chapter number eight. I forget all about the unity was an Ethiopian Jew. So that made the gospel all the way in the first century before any of these other religions came along, was introduced to a black man of Ethiopia. He was an Ethiopian. So when we went there for 12 days, we saw tons of Ethiopian Jews. There was one group that every time 6 o'clock come, they would sound a big alarm, and they had them all white, and they was going directly to the Catholic Church. Hundreds and hundreds of Jews. Am I right, honey? They was going to the Catholic Church. You don't remember? I remember. Yes, they had them all white at 6 o'clock every morning. You would hear a bell ringing, and they was going to the Catholic Church. But then, asleep. huh? You were asleep. She said she was asleep. But then, Brother Alfred, when we was at the crusade, you had another group of black Ethiopian Jews that was going to the crusade. Now, the ones that was going to the crusade, they recognized Jesus as being God, Jesus being Lord. But the ones that was going to the crusade, we saw miracles. We saw people get healed. The ones that was going to the crusade, they was having church almost all day. Rolls on, homemade rolls, battle on their face, battling and worshiping the dirt, getting up, praising God, going back down, standing up through the whole service. When the scripture was read, when the preaching was read, they honored God so much, it was powerful. But my whole point is, so that tells me personally that these disciples didn't all look like this. Now, that's not important for my salvation, but that's important for the truth of the facts of my history understanding. Because in school, they teach us history. And some of that history is it's, it's, it's irrelevant. But this is real, true history. So now I understand that they was of all different types of nationalities. They was of all different types of race. So if you see a Jesus like that, I'm not saying he looked like that. And I'm also not saying that he looked like, 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 like he looked on the cross um, and like he looks there. Because he looks like he's been to a hair salon. He looked like he, got his, he looked like he just fixed up. He looked like he's a Rolling Stone musician or something. That's the image that they wanted to portray because they didn't want us to see God as being something far beyond the imagination or seeing God as somebody that could be seen for everybody to accept one way but their way. So they made him look like he was like that. So if he looked like that, then we would have a problem. It doesn't matter if he don't look like that or not. My whole point of opening up like this is to get you to understand it's the mindset of how they reprogram the church that caused the church to be able to think and feel like they feel. Now, let's go into the message today. We're going to go to the scripture that we want to read. We read from the scripture um, last week, Luke chapter number 24. Let's go to Luke chapter number 24. That's the scripture that we, we open up with. We're going to just use that one scripture, and I'm going to probably end up hitting it on the screen again because it's going to come up. But nevertheless, let's go to Luke chapter number 24. Here go, here go. I'm gonna put it on the screen. Here we go. Here it is, right here. Luke chapter number 24, verses 44 and 45. Okay, Luke 24, 44 and 45. Now look at what he and he said to them. This is after Jesus has rid, risen, and he said unto them, "This is what I told you while I was still with you." Y'all remember me reading that last week? 
This is what I told you while I was still with you. Now he's trying to open them up and get them to understand how real this call and his purpose and his seeking God and doing his will and how real it was for him to come and why he's coming back again and leaving again. Before he do, he wants them to understand his purpose and the assignment, which goes for us as well. He said, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, in the word of God, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Then he opened their understanding so that they could understand the scriptures. Now that was our scripture that we wanted to go to. And I want to just open up talking about three things. Three, three, I'm making a point. When I showed you guys the pictures, I went through the historical setting. It was to make a point to you how man is trying to reprogram God's salvation his way. Man is trying to reprogram Christianity his way. But we're going to find out how they really start who really started, and why did it start that way? So I just got three particular ones I want to talk about. We got, when we get to the year 1900, when you get to the year 1900, that's when you start hearing about Baptist Church. That's when you start hearing about all these different religions. In the 1900s, you start hearing Scientology. Anybody know what Scientology is? It's a rich man's, it's a rich man's religion, first of all, only people in Hollywood and everything. It was founded by a man named Robert Ron Hubbard, and he was the type of man, he made millions of dollars through what he was teaching on Scientology. Just to be real quick, Scientology teaches that mankind is immortal. In other words, it's saying that man is God. It's just like a lot of these other religions, but it's, they got their own twist to it. Tom Hanks and, and um, the lady from King of Queens, all these... Hollywood people, they call up in Scientology, and it teaches that man is God, and he has an endless life. This is what it teaches, just a real brief insert on it, and that it's being called a thiefing, not originally from, the, we're not from this planet, but we're trapped in this planet through matter, energy, and space and time. That's they teach, and that's foolishness. Man is matter, energy, and space. So that's the Scientology. Just two more, and I'm going to get to where I want to get to. Seven day Adventists. Then they come around. All these religions, I'm only mentioning three religions just to make a point to you. When we read what Jesus said to do and how he opened up their understanding and how he spent that time with them, he was showing them how he wanted them to build his church. That's the church that Jesus started that you read about in the book of Acts. I don't want to keep running through this ministry and giving you all these different messages and we don't stay with the foundation of how you have to change your life according to the commandments that God told us in this Bible, in the book of Acts. And it starts with confession, repentance, and being born again. And if you start trying to rationalize this, Google yourself to death on this, pull up all these different YouTube people on this, why don't you just read what the Word say verbatim and just say, okay, this is what's written. If Jesus took the Word of God to speak to the devil in the wilderness, say, it is written. It is written. Every time he spoke to the enemy, he spoke the Word, the enemy had to flee. Every time I speak the word to me when I'm heavy, when I'm pressing, when I'm sick, it has to flee. My wife couldn't even hardly walk yesterday out of nowhere. She was just doing good the whole day. And right by the time we got mother home, it's like she just, I heard her groan. She couldn't even hardly walk. I mean, literally, she was in excruciating pain. And we prayed, and it still hurt. So we went and got a band and put on her foot and massaged it and soaked it in Epsom salt and prayed again and she up and around and she doing better. But my whole point of what I'm trying to say is we follow the principles of the word. I didn't try to get a telehealth doctor on it. Yes, I got my wife at home and she's in the back. Well, she needs to go get her prescription. I'm going to write you a prescription for some pain pills. She needs to take them every three or four hours. She probably has inflammation. Maybe her joints are discomfort. And if you follow this prescription for three or four days, she'll be fine. But if we want to choose to believe what God's word really say and follow it and practice it, it will work. Maybe not simultaneously. Maybe not all at once. But it works. It has to work because Jesus said in the beginning was the word and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yeah. So now we got the seven day Adventists. They come along. And just like I said, just a few more. It was found about a man by the name of William Miller. He was a false prophet who predicted that Jesus would return. This is how they started in the 1900s. So they built that doctrine about you have to have church on a Saturday. I used to be a seven-day Adventist. I used to study Islam. I used to do the pillar of prayer. I used to go to the mosque. I was a Jehovah Witness. I practiced Jehovah Witness for at least a year. I didn't feel nothing practicing that. 
I was still doing my thing, smoking weed, doing everything. I was maybe like 19, 18, but I was seeking. See, that's what I'm saying. God going to always provoke your mind to want to search for something and fill that empty void. But I kept trying to do it my way. But the topic is like last week. God did it his way. Remember the burger can? You can't have it your way. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. No, you can't tell God to hold nothing that he command you to do according to his foundation. You got to follow it and you find out it works. So now that Seven Day Adventist was founded by William Miller. Did that help you, Brother um, Alfred, when I pulled up that black history? Insert. Yeah, sure. it, it, it's very simple, you know. It, we can build. I can build a whole lot from that. But I wasn't trying. I was just trying to make a valid point. So now you got the Jehovah. You got the Seven Day Adventist. Once this man get off the scene, the key person to Seven Day Adventist is a woman by the name of Ellen G. White. A woman. So why am I saying it? All these religions, Kingdom Hall. Here's one more, Kingdom Hall. Why would they call it Kingdom Hall when Jesus said, "Thou kingdom come, Thy will be done." On earth as it is in heaven. His kingdom is heaven. His kingdom came down here to earth. His kingdom is in his sovereignty. His kingdom is in his authority. It's not in me calling a man-made religion. Kingdom Hall of Jehovah Witness. So don't think I'm bad from religion. I'm showing you history, how it got started. And I want you to understand that when you come through those doors, that's why we have up there Disciples for Jesus Ministry of the Apostolic Faith. It's not a denomination. It's not a cult. It's the teachings that Jesus gave to the apostles how to start his church. Period. And no matter how nobody redefined that, it's so elementary. He's telling them what to do right here. You don't need no commentaries. You don't need to sit down with nobody. Just read the book of Acts for yourself. In with Luke chapter number 24. Read that. Read Matthew chapter number 16. Read that. Read Matthew chapter number 28. And then go to Acts. And you'll get your answer on how Jesus started his church. So you get Kingdom Hall. You get all these places where Russell T. All these people started. But the scripture says totally different. Because the scripture lets us know that there is God's way. And his way is the only way. Now these are the two scriptures that I want to put up here for you. I put Luke up there, right? And he said unto them that is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about the law of Moses and the prophets and the son. Then he opened their understanding so they could understand the scripture. Here's our second scripture. Now remember who's talking here, Jesus. Okay? Nobody else but Jesus. This is our last scripture here. We went through last week. Now we come into here. We brought out several things to you about the images, how they was created. And Sister Kenya did a wonderful job by saying colonization. And we want to add into that Sister Kenya Romanization. Because it all started there. Now look at what Jesus said. Now this is what he said in Luke. And this is what he said in Matthew. And Jesus came unto them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Mm -hmm. Now what is this? Is that specific? So all these other authorities, all these other kingdoms, all these other doctrines, all these other religions, and again, when people come through the door, I'm not bashing their religion, but I can give them the history of how it got started. If your religion got started after the fact of the way Jesus started his church, something is wrong. Do y'all agree or disagree? I think I need to pause and get some interacting. Yes, talk to me, Kenya. I was going to say, um, so when people say, oh, Christianity is a religion, I would probably agree with, in, in the sense of, you know, a word, Christianity. But when you're talking about the church, that's, that's different. It's a lifestyle, a way of living when you go about the word of God. So yeah, okay, Christianity, yeah. religion, yeah. everybody that was the beginning or whatever, but we're talking about the one who is has all power on heaven. Yes, and earth. yes, yeah. Because religion just means a belief system. It just means a system of belief that a group of people stand up on on by themselves. So holiness is not a religion. Holiness is a lifestyle. Be ye holy because God is holy. Now, you can define it as religion in the sense of our belief, but our belief is absolute. Our beliefs are doctrine of historical facts. So all these other people, their beliefs came from men, came from people who God created in his own image. They came from people like me and you. 
Man, me and Alfred sit down and get to think of us a religion. We can go out. I mean, this guy is sharp with his skills and his thinking. We can get together and I can school him. He can school me. We can build us a little spiritual platform. And we can go out there and start us. The people are so gullible. They will follow us. All we got to do is do some quick supernatural things to get their they minds twisted. And the devil is used to do these things. John, come here real quick, real quick, and tell them, just give them a real quick snapshot about a, a relative that you got, and tell them about the cards, and tell them what you told them. Just give them, give them, give them about five minutes. Don't give it all to them, but, but give, give them, the, give them the, the, the crust of it. Tell them, tell them, because we want them to see that anybody can start a religion. Oh, uh, my cousin? Yeah. Yeah, one of my cousin, um, he called me and talking to me about it. Yeah. How he's a prophet, he's God. He is God. Living in him, he's God. I said, no, you are not God. Um, he told me he's a prophet. So he's been, I noticed he's been reading cards from his phone, like psychic. I said, anytime you go reading cards and psychic, this is witchcraft. It doesn't matter what, you help me yourself, it's still witchcraft. It doesn't matter, you don't have to go to garden, and do stuff to people to say it's witchcraft. No, any little single thing mm -hmm. to help yourself. Our generation, we did it, our mother did it, but they don't know, try to help our kids, it's witchcraft. We're paying for this now. Mm -hmm. I try to explain to them, to him, but he started arguing with me. I just, just leave him alone, I already tell him the word. Mm -hmm. So. So, so my whole point is, it's like he's talking about his cousin, and he read the tarot cards, and he, he think they work. He he said he they things actually happen that he say happened through those tarot cards. Yeah, when when pharaohs when he, they put their snakes down there, the rod, they, their snakes turned. But guess what? They were swallowed up. And they could only do one more miracle. They couldn't do no more. So the enemy, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual weakness in high places. He has the power that God permits him to have because God wants to show people His power can't compare with mine. But people follow gullible things because they're looking for some kind of way to be able to worship something, anything besides God. But look at what Jesus said. Jesus came and said unto them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I hope you all are getting this. Because I want you to be able to be taught. So when people come through these doors, you will have an understanding of why you're here. So I guess y'all got photographic memories because I don't see nobody never taking no notes or anything if that's what works for you because I don't want you to feel like I'm going to challenge you in any literary way, but I'm going to ask you some questions to see what you're learning Amen. because I'm not here just to talk. I'm here to actually develop disciples for Jesus, but only he can cause you to want to be that. It's my job is to feed you and teach you. Okay, so look what he said. He said, go therefore and make Disciples, here we go with that racism stuff. Here we go with that prejudice stuff. Here we go with that woke movement. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. But who are we doing them for? Me, for him. Nobody else. Nobody else. And he said, go ye there, baptizing them in the name of the Father. And the name of the Son. And the name of of the Holy Spirit. That means those of, of, of means they gotta be one name. That's it. And if you choose not to want to use that name, people have a problem with just saying, just baptize me in the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter as long as I do the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I don't argue with them. I just let you see what the scriptures say. And those that want to do it that way, let's do it. Those that don't, that's going to be between you and God. So you're saying I'm going to hell if I don't baptize people in the name of the Father? I'm saying just do what he said do. Don't try to, don't try to get me to be God and judge you. I'm going to let God's word speak for you. Because if he say do it this way, then obviously when the end comes, he's going to be the judge and let you know who's right and who's wrong. So we, we, we're going to set up a baptismal ceremony. Like I said, we have a place we can do it. We can rent for two and a half hours for $240. We can baptize. We can stay there and do service and everything. When that time comes, when those group of people come, then we're going to do it. Until then, we're going to plan who's here. He said, teaching them to observe. Look at how, look how powerful this simple this is. First, he says, all power is given through me, to me. Baptize them. In the name of the Father, teach, then he said, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. 
It's like a parent saying, boy, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? I'm saying this to you. Why are you going to go ask your auntie something I said you can't do? Why are you going to wait till grandmama come over and she going to pacify you and tell you this? I told you you can't do I commanded you not to do this. But grandma said no. But I said no. So God is saying right here, look, this is what I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. King James said to the end of the age. End you know, of the church age. It's going to come a time when God's going to say enough is enough. He's going to wrap his church out of here and he's going to release the hand of the enemy and this world is going to be twice as bad as it is now. Twice as bad. So, but look at, let, let's get Proverbs 14 and 12. We're moving real good. Proverbs 14 and 12. These scriptures are going for us first. Because I got some ways that I see, but I feel like they're okay for me to still keep. Especially if you're married and you know you need to change some ways about you that you're not changing yet and you can see it's kind of making a little, dis little discomfort and a little tension in the marriage because I'm still stuck on what I feel seems to be right to me. But I got to get somewhere in my mind. I'm going to have to do some changing. Proverbs 14 and 12. It says, There is a way with semen right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So you know I had to examine the text. So I wanted to see if there is a way. I want to look that word way up in the Hebrew and the Greek. Not to sound deep, but it said there is a way. In other words, there's a path. There's a direction. And there are habits. That same right to us to continue to do. This word way carries all these, all these biblical Hebrew and Greek definitions. There is moral character. In other words, there's a lifestyle that seems right to me. There's a path that seems right to me. There are things and behaviors that seem right to me. But the scriptures say the end that there are right. There is a way that seems right. That seems correct. That seems straight. I think back in the day when I was in high school, they'd be like, what's up, man? You all go, I'm straight. He said, I'm straight. Jack out of the pants. So what's up, player? I'm straight. <laughs> I was just, you crooked. <laughs> we are crooked. We are, we are what we are, if we're not saved, a crooked and perverse generation. Wicked. Because we was up to no good. The way of death. Death means you're going to physically die and you're going to spiritually die if you stuck in your own way and you don't want to do it God's way. So now Jesus gave the instructions to his apostles that we read in Luke and that we read in Matthew. Jesus is not, what I'm trying to say to you, Jesus is not just some Savior. He's Lord. Anybody know the difference between a Savior and a Lord? What's a Savior? I'm sorry, y'all. I just can't keep talking to you. You don't, I don't know what you understand. What's, what's our, our Redeemer. Our Redeemer. Our, our Rescuer. Our, our, our Salvation. Our Salvation. Yeah. That's good. What's the, he? Okay, I say Jesus is not just some savior. He's Lord. How is he Lord? Because he's God. He's God. Huh? He's, he rules. And yeah. Yes. 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 This is both of you all are right. This is not just a savior theology only. When Jesus told them what to go and do, he wasn't just saying for people to get saved and get delivered. That was a priority. But Jesus is Lord. Let's let's get Acts chapter number four. Watch this. Y'all answered that really good. Let's get Acts chapter number four. Whew. I tell y'all, y'all look at me up here behind this podium, and y'all don't know my story. I be waiting on God to give me what to teach, what to preach, what to say this Monday morning as I'm here. And this is what he just flowed with this morning. I love that. I love it because I can wait on him, and he gonna do what he gonna do. So look at Acts chapter number four. Let's, let's look at some of it. We, we have to go here, you all. Let's look at some of it. Okay, Acts chapter number four. Now watch this. He's more than Savior. Kenya said it. He's king. Now, I'll, I'm back at you, Alfred. You the only, Ezra, you the only one here, Ezra. Now, you know, that's the king of the house. Because you know what my, my days tell me? Boy, I'm the king of this house. You do what I say. So that means that in, in, in God's eyes, he's not the king. Of his house. He's not the king of his body. He's not the king of his life. Nor are you. Because the fact is, if I'm king of my house in the spiritual, I'm king of my house in the physical, but in the spiritual, Jesus is not the king of my house. That means I sit on my own throne. 
And my life seemeth right unto me. And that's the way I'm going to live. But if Jesus is king, then I remove myself from the throne. And he sits on the throne. But if he's on the throne, if he's ruling, that means I got to obey him. That means I got to follow him. And that means it might hurt to do. But look at what happened. Now let's, let's, I'm showing you just how serious. This is why we don't hear the name of Jesus in a lot of churches today. Because number one, they're in that governmental system and they're getting that money. And they're, getting the, they're in the community connection type thing. And a lot of times, when you start speaking that name specifically, stuff get cut off from you. I'm trying to go through Walmart. I can't go through Walmart and say I'm doing it for a church. I got I to gotta put it, do it up on our church, our church name, which is the Disciple Jesus Community. Community Center. I did that deliberately. Unfortunately, I'm not trying to get money. I'm just trying to get an opportunity to be able to set up what we can do like the Girl Scouts and the Cub Scouts and we can set a table and we can invite people to church. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to get in the Yorktown Mall. I can't go through the mall and say we want to do a church service. I got to say we want to do a community. See, everything got to have a different brand, a different name to it. You're not a janitor no more. You're a maintenance engineer. You're not a, a beautician, you're a hairstylist. Everything got to have a fancy, it got to have a different twist to it now. But that's okay. But watch what these apostles do. This is Peter and John. Now in verse Acts chapter number four, and as they spake unto the people, the priests, the captains of the temple, the Sadducees came unto them, the religious people. This is where the problem is at. Verse two, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus. See, all these other religions I put up there, all these other teachings I put up there, they're not teaching through Jesus. They're not teaching the resurrection of Jesus. They're not teaching the wicked verse two with me. Through Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them, put them in hold until the next day, for it was now evening. They couldn't do nothing at a certain time of the day, not upon the Roman law. Verse four, how be it many of them which heard the word believed. Now what we say about that word believed, that means they had confidence, they trusted, and they was willing to obey it. Not believe with their mouth, and their hearts was far from him. They believe with change in their life. Let's get the proof of that. How be it the heard but believe, and the number of men was about 5,000 yeah. believers. Yeah. Now people go to the course, they don't say there they was baptized in Jesus' name, they don't say there they was filled with the Holy Spirit. But if you keep reading enough, you'll notice in certain chapters, like chapter number 11, chapter number 15, when Peter had to deal with the Jews, when Paul had to deal with the Jews, he said they received the Holy Ghost as we did, the same as we did. And if the same as we did, I mean, they got it the same way. It don't have to every time record, 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 record. So then people say, well, you reading into that what you're reading into it. If it says they received it as we did, then that's what I'm going to receive. That's how they get it. Okay? Make sense? Now, at many of 5,000, and it came to pass on the mark that the rulers, these are the religious people again, and the elders and the scribes, and Ananias the high priest, and Siapus, and John, and Alexander, and as many were of kind of the high priest, were gathered together in Jerusalem. Now they're upset because it's not about them having a religion, it's about the God that they're talking about. This is what's happening in the 21st century church. They're setting us down from talking specifically about Jesus. They don't care about you talking about God. Right. They don't want you to talk about Jesus. So let's, let me try to wrap this up right here. And when, verse number 7, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked them, look at these dummies, verse 4 and 7, by what power or by what name have you done this? They said, we got a question for y'all. By what power or what name have you done this? You know, back in the day, I didn't, we didn't have we didn't have good sense. We we work and we tell people about Jesus. We take our Bibles to work. We take we tell people about Jesus in the cafeteria. Everything they had no problems with that. You do that now. Do it now. Do it in the nursing field. Do it. Go in the, go in that cafeteria when all the nurses is on break. Say, good evening, everyone. I just want you to know that Jesus loves you. You know God is one. You know there was a scripture that says in Acts four and twelve, neither that salvation. Then uh, I'm not in every day. I need to see you in the office. You're offending people. They didn't used to do that, but at the same time, they did used to oppose us, but they didn't know how to really approach us because the power of God was so real. We had that holy boldness. We, we, was, we was a little unlearned. We didn't have no skill and no tact. We was dogmatic. We needed some discipline. We needed some help, but our hearts was in the right place. But now you don't even have that problem. And look at what happens here. The verse number eight, then Peter... Filled with the Holy Spirit. I like to say Holy Spirit because people can relate to that better than ghosts. That's the translation. 
said unto them, ye rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, you religious rulers, the nerve you to ask us about what power and what name, what's the matter with you all? Y'all know the Old Testament. Y'all know that Jesus said it was written to me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Y'all know he's all up in there. And y'all going to ask us this question. This is what they basically saying to them. If we this day, verse 9, be examined with the good deed done to this impotent man, this lame man, but what means he is made whole? Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel. Now they get mad, holy mad. Be it all of y'all. That by the name of, now they're going to be specific with them. By the name of Jesus Christ, you know his hometown, Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Even by him doeth this man stand before you whole. The power of God was so real, they couldn't even deny it. So he let them know. I'm going to read one more verse and we're going to let that go. Verse number 12. Watch how Peter locks this in. He said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none of the name of the heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. Amen. Now verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, I'm bold, y'all. I might be a little guy. I stand, if it was president, I don't care if the, if the president of whatever corporation comes, I stand and look at him right in the face and let him know God's plan and God's way of salvation and won't even tremble about doing it. Because I did it to I did it to maximum security murderers. And some of them guys were way up there. And they was big and they looked scary and horrifying. But when you walk in the authority of God's word, that little physical appearance don't mean nothing. Because their hearts is just as empty, soft, and long as you, you would be surprised. They, not, they, they need help just like everybody else. So he let them know with boldness. And John and proceeded, they were unlearned and ignorant. Now why is it saying they was unlearned? Because they was dealing with religious, educated leaders. And they knew that they didn't go to the Jewish school as they went to. They knew they weren't taught by the rabbis that they was taught by. But they could tell they'd been with Jesus. Why could they tell they'd been with Jesus? Because they were able to bring them back to what the word of God said. And they couldn't deny it. So that's a very important scripture for us to be able to read. So Isaiah 42 and 8 says, Am I the Lord? And you don't have to turn to it. I'm just going to call it out. Isaiah 42 and 8 says, Am I the Lord that is in my name and my glory? Will I not give to another? Neither praise to a graven image. That's Isaiah 42 and 2. God is saying, I'm the Lord. I'm not giving my praise to nobody. So there's no religious. There's no religious founder that's going to give my praise. There's no images that's going to be put up. Graven images or nothing. Nothing. Romans chapter 10, verse number 9 said, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thy heart, that's Romans 10 and 9, Jesus is Lord, and shall be saved. In thy heart, God is raising from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That means based upon you believe it, based upon you obeying. But look at Romans 10 and 10, it says, But with the heart, man believe it. That means with the mind. That means my spirit and my mind is tuned in with believing who Jesus say he is. With the, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Mm. So that means now I'm believing and I'm confessing that Jesus is not only just Savior, but he's Lord. If you only see Jesus as a Savior, you will only need him when you're in trouble. Mm. Maria, that was a good answer. He's Lord, he, he rescues, he saves. And that's what people only see Jesus as, as a Savior. They see him, to, they want him to rescue them and they want him to provide for them. In other words, God, what can you say to me? What can you do for me? Yeah. That's why when people come to church, we have to tell them the truth. When you get born again, you, you don't just have a Savior. You have a Lord, but there's going to be some prices you're going to have to pay. There's going to be some people that's going to turn their back on you. There's some people that's going to try to hate you. There's some people going to talk about you. There's some people going to say you're crazy. Because, in fact, you're different. But when we see him as Savior, you're saying, God, what can you do for me? Not, not what can I do for him. I'm more focused on, in my age, I'm more focused on building this ministry right now. I'm concerned on what can I do for God. I can't make nobody be saved. I can't enforce nobody, but I can go out there and reach out to them. What can I do for God? I can be a servant to people. I can do things to show people that they're loved. No, nothing. so what can I do for God? No, that's not the king. The thing, but as king, he gets involved in my life. That's why we made that point that when you say you're the king of the house, the kids, they got to do things the way you set up for them to live. 
Israel. As long as they live in your house, they got to follow your rule. So if Jesus is king of our life, he has to get involved in our life. Are y'all hearing me? Amen. Is this making sense? I know it is anyway. So let's close it out. Psalms 37. Please write this down. Psalms 37 and 23. See, I can take all, I can take almost a whole hour of just willy-nilly talking and just inserting humor and inserting assumptions and inserting good conversation and be very charismatic about it. So it looks like I'm doing a lot of turn to read, turn to, but this is the only way for us to get understanding. The word, Psalms 37 and 23. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his ways. In other words, the steps, in other words, the goings. Now, when you're talking about the steps of a good man ordered by the Lord, that means he has a companionship with God. When I'm in marriage with my wife, my steps are ordered in love. My steps are ordered in companionship. That's how my steps are ordered. When my wife told me her foot was wrong, immediately my steps was ordered in companionship. Go get some Epsom salt and soak her foot and massage it and relax her. Because that was an order that, that was a doing, that was a going I had to perform that step. It's the same way with God. Psalms is saying, David is saying, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The Lord is our one who we should have companionship with. To be ordered, the steps of a good man are ordered, that means they are established, set up, fixed. By the Lord. So if my step, if I'm a, not Christian, but if I'm a holiness practicing sanctified, you can put Christian on their last, then my steps should be established, set up, and fixed according to the word of God. Not according to no church creed. Not according to no church theology. Not according to no church doctrine. If the creed and the theology and the doctrine is this, specifically, Justification, glorification, sanctification, all of those things, then it is the right one. So my steps have to be ordered not by man. So my steps have to be ordered by the Lord. Y'all know that song that was popular by Hezekiah Walker, Sold Out. Sold Out. Oh, they, my mind is made up. My heart is fixed. My mind made up. They be kidding me, boy. That's, right. That's a powerful song. Yeah. And 90% of the people that sing that song know they're not sold out. Maybe 100%. Because really, none of us are sold out. But if our steps are ordered by the God, then we learn how to let him establish us. We get established when we come like this. People, you know what's amazing? Let me just close today. Because enough has been said for you to be able to deposit. I pray and help you. It's amazing how our steps are ordered now. This lady called me on a Sunday from home health care for my mother. People do everything on a Sunday. It was a time where people didn't even open their businesses on a Sunday. It was a time where Sunday was automatically that people didn't do nothing. Now it just gotten to the point we're sold out from God and we sold into our own agendas. I'm not saying this to be funny to nobody because I had to learn it too. And I raised five kids. And it was not easy for me to work to raise five kids. But I had to make a decision in my mind. I'm going to do a certain point or what I'm going to do, but I'm not going to kill myself to try to provide for my family and don't have no time for God. And I, I, you just can't have time for God. If he's going to be my king, i got to have the time for him to see what his purpose is for me him as my king. Because a king rules and he gives you orders and instructions. And once he comes into the presence, we bow to him. We worship him. We honor him. That's the starting point. That's where the prayer life come in at. So if he's your savior, that's good. But if he's your king and your savior, that means we're going to build a prayer relationship with him first. But the first relationship we're going to build is how to be born again, how to be cleansed, how to be changed. So let me give you one more scripture. We're going to close it out today. Proverbs chapter number three. We're going to do verses five, six, and seven. Can you give me a little softy, baby? Give me a little soft music. Soft worship music. Sister, Proverbs chapter 3. I'm sorry, sometimes I just be flowing out of my own mind. forget where I'm at. Amen. Uh, Amen. Can you give me a little soft music, Sister Johnson? Amen. Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 5. Now let's get a look, look at what God is saying. This is one of me and my wife's, but this is one of me and my wife's favorite scriptures. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. And lean not to their own understanding. 
Why everything has to be done on the day that we can commit to God, but then everything that's done on that day to God, it has a short time limit to it. See, the church that Jesus started, they didn't care if they was in church five or six hours. I don't think we should be in church five or six hours. But I also think that we should be willing to sacrifice our minds in our ears, in our heart, in our life to God for whatever time it takes, as long as it's for the purpose of Him feeding us and the Spirit is in the place. Now, you shouldn't have to sit there and they praise dancing you for three hours, they're doing all these other things for three hours, they're flashing all kind of things. No, 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 no. But when it's really God feeding you and it's really God's purpose, like when we're in prayer, that prayer was moving me today. So keep coming, keep coming to prayer and watch how it starts changing its atmosphere. I challenge you. Keep coming. Even if you sitting there and you just trying to pray, just keep coming and watch how the scripture came live. Where two or three are together, he's in the midst. You're going to find a warmth coming over you, a discomfort or something happening in your spirit. So verse number six, in all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Now when it say acknowledge him, that means in all thy ways, have fellowship, have intimacy with him. And he will guide your life. Verse number seven. Be not wise in thy own eyes. That's why I'm reading these scriptures. Because if, if, if I'm, if I'm going to identify myself as an example, I need to show you why I'm saying what I'm saying. Because I had to follow what I'm saying to you. I had to follow what I'm saying to you. I remember working two jobs. I remember I stopped wanting to work two jobs, and I remember the fear in my mind. I started calculating up if I let this go, then this gonna go behind, this gonna go behind, this gonna go behind. And I let go of that second job and stayed committed to the Lord. And he just kept on multiplying, kept on multiplying. Because there's a way, be not wise in our own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Now, that's enough there for us today. That's God's way. God did it his way. His way is the way Jesus said do it because Jesus got his instructions from the Father and because he was manifested in human flesh as the Spirit of God, manifested for us to see the demonstration of how we are to apply and believe God's word. I'm so glad for this Bible because I can run to this when I'm heavy and God give me just what I need to hear. Just when I have to be real careful because sometimes, you know, when you're really heavy, I'll be trying to think of who I can pull up on YouTube that would encourage me. Andrew Warmack, Bill Winston. You know, I just start thinking of inspiring people. And that's cool. But now I'm at a point where, you know what, God? I just want to shut everybody down. I just want to hear what you're going to say. I want to hear what you're going to show to me. And this is why it's so important for us to understand. We have to do it God's way. Let's stand. Hallelujah. 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 Oh God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for those that are present, Lord. And those that would have been present for whatever blockage they had, we ask that you would break that stronghold, bind that strong man. Oh God, rather it's, oh God, could have been diarrhea at the last minute. Could have just been, oh God, body just shut down and feel exhausted. Could have just been a distraction, just got a phone call to go somewhere, just do something pleasurable. Who knows what it was, what it is. But Lord, all we know, Lord God, is as we pray, we ask that you will draw your way, that you will bring forth souls your way. But Lord, those of us that are consistent, those of us that are sacrificing our Sunday for you, sacrificing our time for you, Lord, we need you to begin to give us clear understanding and urgency with a passion to surrender more and more to you. You said in all by getting, getting understanding. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for you doing it your way. We thank you for the revelation, oh God, of how we know that your church is the way you started, not the way we want to start it. We thank you for your word being a living word and not our word that's really a dead word. Lord, we thank you because you said the words that speak unto us are spirit and they are life. And Lord, we thank you for the life-giving word and for your spirit, Lord. Look upon us all that are present today, Lord, John, Alfred, Ezra, Kenya, Carmen, and Maria, and your servant, Lord. Lord, we ask that you will bless us and keep us, make your face shine upon us, lift your countenance upon us, and give us peace. In Jesus' name, amen.